Word in your ear returns to live operations on September the 25th at a new home, 21 Soho, which is just round the corner from Tottenham Court Road Tube Station. Our guest that evening will be Richard Morton Jack talking about Nick Drake and his book about same, and also Kathy Unsworth on her book about all things goth. Join us, do. It'll be a new dawn. Welcome to another edition of Word in Your Ear, and uh, and this time we intend to paint a picture of a, of a of a world that was thick with cigarette smoke, and it was awash with pork pies and with brown ale, and there were bands with names like Rugulator and Bees Make Honey and Ducks Deluxe that roamed the earth, and uh, they're now back uh, and uh, very fondly remembered in this book called Before It Went Rotten. Uh, about the pub rock scene in London in 1972 to 1976. And uh, so, yes, light up an embassy, uh, pour yourself a Mackerson, and meet the author, Simon Matthews. Simon, it's lovely to see you. It's very nice of you to have me on your show. Thank you. Great. And you're in, I think you're in West Ireland now, but you lived in London at the time, didn't you? I was. I was there, yes. And now, so it's got, a, it's got a very different uh, kind of Irish connection, hasn't it? This whole scene, the kind of pub rock scene explain what the irish connection is well there was a network of pubs in london that tended to have irish landlords that had always put on music which is a common feature of course in ireland and um in the early 70s when it became more ex um, expensive for bands to sort of tour particularly when the price of petrol went up oh of course and it became prohibitively expensive to be spending nights outside London in hotels and driving up and down what passed for a motorway network uh, back then. Uh, it, quite a few bands started playing smaller gigs, smaller venues, more local venues, mainly clustered around London with a few um, outlying places like the Nags Head, High Wycombe or Friars Aylesbury. And the Irish network of venues, such as it was, worked quite well with that. And the manager of Brinsley Schwartz, um, Dave Robinson from Dublin, um, began to put together a, a whole roster of um, other venues that he could book bands into. And that was the sort of basis of the whole pub rock network. So he'd go to pubs and say, what what night do you have trouble getting a load of people in? Well, he would go to a pub, he'd talk to the landlord. The landlord would often be Irish and say, look, I can I can do music two nights a week if you want, five nights a week if you want, and um, you get so much for this. You either get money up front or you get huge bar takings, and we keep the money on the door, or some such similar arrangement. The breweries weren't really involved in it. Right. There were various things uh, you you put in the book, which I thought were really interesting actually, about things that that helped create a world where pub rock could happen. You know, the success of Easy Rider in America, the rock and roll revival, electric mm. blues revival. Tell mm. us a bit more about that. Oh, where do you begin? Um, I mean, well, it was Easy Rider, and well, that was just a, an appetite for American music, wasn't it? Something yeah, like I mean. Americana, as such, was huge in the early 70s, absolutely gigantic as a phenomenon. Um, I think Credence Clearwater Revival are a good starting point. They, had, they must have had five or six chart albums in Britain alone, um, most of which I've got, actually, and I've kind of re-listened to them. And it, they, their, their music is something of a template for the later pub rock sound. Um, as as were people like Canned Heat or the later version of The Birds or even yeah. Crosby, Crosby, Stills, Nash and Young to whom early Brinsley Schwartz were compared mm -hmm. at one point. Yeah. Um, and it was just about, I mean, the rock and roll revival thing as such sort of kicked off with Dave Edmonds' I, I Hear You Knocking, which was a, a kind of surprise number one. Yeah. Uh, although it wasn't Edmund's first here. Um, but that is, is, is very similar to Canned Heat in sound. Very kind of similar kind of uh, blues boogie, I suppose. 
Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and there was a market for it. Um, that obviously wasn't all the music that was selling in Britain. There were, you know, you had Slade, T Rex, David Bowie, and you had all the massive prog bands and so on and so forth. But there was a corner of the market that wanted music like that that was ill served in terms of people being able to, to see very much of it live. Right. Um, hence, you get this sort of production of several different waves of pub rock bands that kind of play stuff more or less like that. Who invented the term pub rock? Good question. I've no idea. Um, Was it Time Out magazine? Charlie uh, Gillett or something uh, like that? It's Time Out. Well, I, I do think it's but, quite interesting that Time Out was so instrumental in kind of setting up all these scenes in London, wasn't it? Gay London, yeah. pub rock London, Real Ale London, all those kind of things. And I always felt I read about pub rock mainly in Time Out. At the, the time. Uh, from my, I mean, Ace were the first band to be referred to as a pub rock band. Right. A band coming out of London's new pub rock scene. And at the time, several people said, well, well hang on a minute, bands have always played in pubs. This, this, this isn't anything new. You could You could go back to... You could go back to the 1950s and people were playing jazz in pubs. I mean, there's always been a music scene in pubs. So it was it was a sort of rather, um, it, it was a case of a piece of terminology being kind of manufactured to, as a, a sort of shorthand way of referring to something, I think. Yeah, yeah. But it's always good to be attached to a scene, isn't it, really? Because yeah. it's yeah. always easier to get publicity because you, you like something else. So yeah. tell, tell us about that. People often talked about, talk about eggs over easy, this uh, mysterious American, well, not quite a band, were they, that, who ended up in London? Well, yeah, it's, you, you, you really do have to do a lot of research to kind of work out what they were really about. Um, they were three American singer-songwriters who had met previously in the United States, and they were, uh, they were hired by Canon Films. And Canon Films had had a big hit with a film called Joe, which is a sort of um, story about a blue-collar American man who is outraged when his daughter goes to live in a hippie commune or something and takes revenge with his rifle on all the peace-loving hippies. Um, <clears throat> but it was a huge hit, and it was kind of looked on as part of the counterculture of the time in much the same way that Easy Rider was. And there were plans to have a whole series of films made by them like that, and Canon Films needed people who could write soundtracks. So they, they had these three guys who could write their own songs, and they decided to send them to London um, sometime in 1970 and found a house for them to live in Kentish Town. The reason they went to London was because London in 1970 was still just about the cinema capital of the world. It hadn't collapsed in the way that it did later in the 70s. So they were hanging around in London expecting to make film soundtracks. Lo, there were no film soundtracks to be made. And one day, uh, one of the band just walked into the local pub, the Tally Ho, and said, can we play here one night? And they had a spare night, so they said yes. And by all accounts, they were a very good live band, although listening to their album, which was recorded a couple of years later, or uh, yeah, they don't seem that remarkable by today's standards, shall we say. But they were very influential, weren't they? Because I mean, Dave Robinson, who we were talking about earlier, who managed British Force, yeah. wanted British Force to sound a bit like them, didn't he? He's that, that American sound, which became a, yeah, one of the I templates. Think- well, they were authentic Americans. Yeah, um, they yeah. Didn't bump into too many authentic American musicians at that time, unless they were travelling as part of mm. some really massive yeah. band. And also, they they had a huge repertoire. They they had about thirty or forty songs of their own, 
and they could just play any any material, which is which is I, I think I think is why they got hired to do film soundtracks. I'm sure. And people would call out from the they would say to the audience, "What song do you want next?" And people would say, "Do Eight Miles High" by the Birds, and they play Eight Miles High. Or somebody would say, "Do Brown Sugar," the latest Rolling Stones single, and they would play Brown Sugar. You know, and people mm. would say, wow, this is amazing. You know, and they're American too. Yeah. <laughs> You know, and one of them used to play with David Blue, and the other one played in a, a band that's an offshoot of Grutner. Yeah, an airplane. <laughs> <laughs> a first, I never thought I'd live to see the mention of Grutner in the book, but there it I saw is. Them down the pub, I went down the pub, and I, I, I didn't even have to pay to see them. You know. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, so yeah, it was. It, it was. There was a, a real excitement about all of it. Yeah, and. Um, they would do maybe you know twenty five songs in an evening and then go home, and I, I I think that's what Dave Robinson was getting at. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was the kind of what about the South End uh, scene? It's, 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 there's quite a bit about that in the book. It's really interesting. I think you know you've got the Kersal Flyers, you've got the Feel Goods at Eddie Hot Rocks. What was it about South End that gave it that kind of identity? Uh, so much happened in that small space. It avoided the worst aspects of London, of uh, the fashionable London scene. Um, it, you know, where kind of back, where kind of um, what was cool changed every year. Yeah. Um, it it kept uh, it it managed because it was outside London to still to still keep a kind of little coterie of bands that played three minute songs uh, together. Um, you had Peter Eden living there. He was actually a pretty good record producer and quite an interesting character who had his own record shop in the town. And, yeah, I mean, the roots of, I mean, Dr. Feelgood and the Curacao Flyers go back to the late 1960s, really. And they just carried on playing that kind of music. And there was a market for it around small towns. You know, I mean, you'd go, you sort of go... In in a way that perhaps there wasn't in London. I mean, you kind of go to a small town in Essex, and there'd be a band on in a hall somewhere, or a support act, you know, to to a kind of major touring band, and they'd still be doing rhythm and blues numbers. So, mm, mm. and it just came good for them in the early seventies. One you- of the one of the great characteristics, I think, uh, about it all was that. that it was a kind of uh, a reaction to, you know, big rock stars and silk blouses or whatever. It was people on stage who looked like their audience, people on stage who got on, on stage in the clothes they were kind of already wearing. And it struck me that, thinking about Kilwood and the High Roads, that I wondered if Ian Deary would, would have made it in any other world apart from pub rock, where his group just looked like a load of misfits from the public bar who evolved into a band. Do you think that might have you know been the right environment for him to 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 develop i don't think he, i don't think ian jury would have got i don't really think he would have got a band together in the 60s and succeeded no i don't think so at all it just uh, happened to be uh, that i mean i i spoke to charlie hart i mean I, as one of the many in, of the surviving musicians that i interviewed and I, I put it to Charlie Hart that this is really what Ian Jury was really doing was a sort of form of performance art, which was quite successful in, in the late sixties, early seventies. Um, and he had, he generally had musicians around him who were quite old as well. I mean, some of them were his students from Canterbury School of Art, but a lot of the other people that he played with, and he played with, I think, I think Kilburn and the High Roads, he went through 19 people in four years. Yes, that's yeah. right. He sacked them all. <laughs> um, and he did the same with the blockheads. They later. never look very relaxed, do they? <laughs> <laughs> he, you know, th- these were very experienced people. And, yeah, I mean, he was able to, I mean, he couldn't have done an act like that in the 60s and probably couldn't have got it he couldn't have got away with it later in the eighties. When no, yeah, that's true. Actually. Yeah, it's <laughs> commercial. Yeah, no, and that would have been that was the video age too. You know, they just they were able to they just look like people from a pub who just happened to be in a band. You know, yeah, yeah. but they were they were dressing. I mean, 
they did consciously dress down. They looked like yeah. buttons when when you saw them, or a group of rather rough alcoholics. From, yeah, 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 they absolutely. They, they they hadn't been groomed at all. <laughs> they, I, can remember, that was, I can remember. I mean, that was that was a deliberate anti-fashion. Yeah, it was. The yeah. jury took, and he later he was later managed by uh, was it Tommy Roberts, uh, Mister Freedom. Yeah. And they and they all dressed in gangster suits at one point. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. So there's something going on there. He's playing around with fashion ideas. Yes. But even Kilburn and the High Road, it's one theme all the way through the book. Is people they they eventually they get written about, they get celebrated, they get kind of good support slots and so forth, and then they get a record deal, and they all make an album, and pretty much all of the albums. With the exception, I think, of Doctor Feelgood, failed. Is that is that fair to say? It is. Yeah, um, a slight caveat required here. I think um, you will you will recollect that the chart placings were compiled by uh, chart return chart return shops, yeah. yeah, which were often department stores or very upmarket established record shops. And a lot of the albums that, you know, pub rock bands produced wouldn't necessarily have sold in Woolworths, for instance, or HMV or something like that. They tended to sell in networks of independent record shops. So we're not quite sure how many they were selling. But whatever they were selling, it wasn't enough to get in, into the top 30. Yeah. But the record companies themselves were kind of disappointed, you know, because they, they, it, it was very hard to put on vinyl what it was that these bands did in a pub what was exciting in the back room of a pub in the cold light of a studio it was it was it was cover versions wasn't it that, yeah that's I, mean, it. I, I think that's true i mean there, there was a common view at, at the time that most of the albums didn't really come across as exciting as the bands came across live and as you say most of them didn't sell i mean um uh Doctor Feelgood had a chart hit. Um, oh, definitely. Castle Flyers had a hit single at one point, I think. Yeah, yeah, but that's a bit later, isn't it? It was yeah. later. Yeah, it was a kind yeah. of pop record, actually. But I, also, none of them kind of broke out beyond Britain, really, did they? I mean, was nobody made any inroads uh, into America? I mean, they presumably because they simply couldn't understand the Britishness of the whole the whole notion. Would that be right? Uh, yeah. Yes, I, yes, I think that's true. That they, they were too insular. Um, yeah. They were also, I think, broadly speaking, even American audiences would have just said, "Why? What's the excitement about this? This stuff has been done. Why? Yeah. You know, why do people want to see a band playing Route 66? You know, I know where Route 66 is. You know, I mean, yeah. But but also in America, they'd always had that tradition of bar bands that you go down the corner and there is somebody who'll do a fairly decent version of Roots. Yeah, and play covers. That's what they Whereas do. in Britain, we'd never had that. Yeah, it was a novelty. Uh, until pub rock. And, and then we only had it really in, in London, really, yeah, for, for a short it, period of time. I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean by the mid-'80s, most of that scene's gone anyway, isn't it? So it didn't actually... It didn't actually last that long. I mean, you'd be hard put to say there was a similar scene today, I think. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, no, in America, you've always had, you know, guys who, who were just really good, not particularly original, but they were really accomplished. Graham and Parker and the Rumor made it in America. Yes, okay. Yeah. They sold, yes, they did sell some records, that's true. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, say made it in America. They did They did manage to sort of get a couple of silver discs or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Elvis Costello, Declan, he eventually became really big in America, and he is an, he is an absolutely typical pub rock actor. Actually. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, completely, absolutely. You look at those early pictures and the clothes they wore, clogs, I think they're wearing in one of the pictures, you know. Flared, flared denims, you know, and Nick Lowe too. Nick Lowe did really well, you know. But yeah. it's funny, I mean, I, I only got to see 
it's pub rock really at the tail end of it. So I tend to see groups like Rugulator and Ducks Deluxe and all that. And, and there was that feeling that they knew, I felt, that their number was up. I remember Rugulator in their, in their matching zip-up jumpsuits playing their kind of really, really complicated, kind of steely Dan complexity music, you know, and, and at a time when nobody seemed to want that. The appetite was for three chords, you know. Yeah, so did, did, they, did they feel resentful, do you think, those guys that suddenly punk rock had arrived and pulled the rug out for one of them? Um, I didn't catch that when I was talking to Martin Belmont or Danny Adler. I didn't yeah. see any, uh, any sort of form of resentment. By, by the way, by the way, everyone, everyone said, oh, yeah, Danny Adler was really great. Everyone I interviewed... Yeah. And I said, who do you, you know, who do you think is the best band? People would say, oh, Dr. Feelgood and Brindy Short's good. Danny Adler, great guitarist. Right. So he's, he's very highly regarded by his peers. Yeah. Um, I don't think, yeah, I mean, it must have been hard at, hard at the time to be on, you know, 15 pounds a week or 20 pounds a week or whatever they were getting, or not even that, and having to do all, all that live work and, just not seeing very much. And, and seeing people older than you, like the Stranglers or Joe Strummer or whatever, suddenly just tearing past you in the outside lane. Yeah. Yeah, basically, yeah. I mean, but it all, it all, um, it all suddenly in, inverted as a scene in the last couple of months, 1976. I mean, I, I can remember this personally. Right up until almost the end of 1976, everyone spoke about Eddie and the Hot Rods, or yeah. Graham Parker and the Rumour. Nobody, nobody really, nobody really rated the Sex Pistols. No. And then suddenly, bang, everything changes. And that's what I cover in the kind of last chapter, really. Um, this sort of, this immense act of hustling that um, took place to convince the UK music media that punk rock was a gigantic youth scene when it when in fact it was it consisted of probably 300 people or something well that's only like swinging London in the mid 60s isn't it that was 300 people as well yeah. <laughs> and, uh, just, just a lot of them happened to be in the media so yeah, well, be... <laughs> well but also you know the reason Time magazine in 1966 or whenever it was came to London and did swinging London was the same reason the enemy did Sex Pistols and The Clash, because it was a story. Yeah. And it, it was a story that was changing every day, yeah. suddenly. You know? And it was taking place in London, on your doorstep. And so a, a, any journalist went out in late 1976, 77, something happened. They came back with something to write about. Yes, indeed, indeed. I mean, um, and the management of both those two bands were very obliging towards Of course them. they were. Of course they were. Of course they were. Who were the great white hopes, you think, that, that that never kind of got the credit they deserved? You know, people like Brinsley Schwartz. I mean, there were certain brands who looked like they were in position to to really take off, and it never happened. Ooh. To, to never quite... Bands for whom it never quite happened. Um, well, the ones you thought should have deserved to go further. I think... With hindsight, GT Moore and the Reggae Guitar. Oh, right. oh yeah. <laughs> I've probably got that record here. <laughs> See, they, they disappeared without trace, didn't they? They did, pretty much. Yeah, I spoke to Gerald Moore. Interesting, <laughs> interesting guy. Yeah. Uh, with a long ancestry, he had long, he, he goes back some way. You know, he was in a hippies, he was in a hippies in a field band before he, he was in GT Moore called Heron. Who did a couple of albums and he made kind of folk albums with a Persian folk singer called Shusha. Mm -hmm. uh, he he's I mean his I mean the reggae guitars were doing the kind of stuff that the police later became phenomenal. Yes, that's true. <laughs> yes. Phenomenally successful with. And they were doing it probably just as well as the police did. But they, they missed the curve by about I don't know, eighteen months or something. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so that I, I think that probably should have happened for them. The Winkies are now. Yes. Oh uh, yeah, was that Phil Rambo's group? Phil Rambo. Yeah, they they, they yeah. sort of 
1974, 74. Yeah. They kind of were a very, very good kind of power pop band that could have really done quite a lot had they had they appeared sort of two or three years later. Yeah. Um, possibly, I think, possibly the Count Bishops. Right. Oh, I saw the Count Bishops. Yes. Yeah, I, I, I saw them. I thought they were pretty good, actually. And, I, I mean, again, they, I mean, the Count Bishops, um, the Damned, the Stranglers, the Jam, Squeeze, are all going before 1976. They've got, yeah. they've got nothing to do with Malcolm McLaren. Yeah. Any of those people. The Count Bishops got kind of like, looked slightly um, too old, if you like. They um, did. Gosh, I haven't thought about them for nearly 50 years. <laughs> that's extraordinary. Well, that's that's the good thing about being asked by a publisher to write a book about pub rock. You you end up thinking about things that you haven't thought about. Yeah. What was officially the end of pub rock, you think, then? Was there, was there? I mean, is it as simple as saying it was new, new rows coming out? Or, I mean, was there something, do you think, that was kind of signified that um, it was its final curtain? Um. I would, I think, I think when the Sex Pistols had started to have top 10 hits and pretty much after that, so did the Stranglers and the Jam and the Clash. Yeah. And selling. The idea of being in a band with scruffy denims and plaid shirts doing a set that sounded like Credence Clearwater Revival um, or similar suddenly went out the window. In a way that's it, it probably be for any, I, I, I suspect for people younger than ourselves would be very hard to understand now because fashions don't change every year now like they used to change in the Yeah, that's bit. true. <laughs> I mean, the idea that you could be, you could be in a band in 2018, 2019, and it, it, everything's cool, but it, you're completely obsolete by 2020. Wouldn't wouldn't simply register with anyone. But, that absolutely, you yeah. know. But that's what it's like now. Um, that was what it was like then. You know, if you're in yeah. 1973, I'm sorry, you can't go on stage in 1977 looking like that. You know. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, it, I think by by the sort of summer of nineteen seventy seven, it's over. Although there are a few holdouts, a few people who peter on for a few years. I think it lacked a, a kind of identity. I was thinking there'd been lots of punk rock compilations, but I don't know how many pub. I mean, Dave's put some wonderful pub rock tracks on the compilations he's done, but but I don't think there've been pub rock compilation albums. And if there were, I, I, again, I don't think it has that kind of that kind of. Um, tribal thing that would have sold it. Did well, you feel it, it had... It isn't, I mean, there wasn't really one single sound. No, absolutely. I mean, if you, people, I mean, there was much more of a co cohesive sound with punk, which is, I mean, I mean, the That's punk, right. No, there was a kind of prog sound and there was a rock and roll <laughs> sound. Was There was a country sound, actually, wasn't there? And a blues sound. It's true. Yeah, I mean, one of the, over, one of the overlooked areas, which, which I've kind of thought about and uh, was there were an awful lot of funk bands that played in pubs um, funk soul bands you, you, I mean you yeah. had people like Kokomo yeah, uh, FBI, Moon Kado Bell, there seems to be quite a lot Moon. of Moon yeah, Moon. Yes, I remember them yeah. uh, who were actually in 1976 Moon and Kado Bell yeah, yeah. were typical of the bands that the record labels were putting money into it. Well, they yeah. were, yeah, definitely. And, and suddenly, a year later, bang, hopeless case. Meal yeah. ticket as well. Meal, Meal ticket. Meal oh, ticket. God, I saw them. Yes. <laughs> How incredible. There are so many. Of them. I know. They, so, I mean, the conclusion I come to is it sold a lot of plaid shirts. It may not have sold many records. It sold a lot of plaid shirts. The other thing is it sold a lot of beer. Didn't it? <laughs> no, seriously. <laughs> Which is it achieved the or original objective yeah. of the landlords who took it on. I mean, it got people well, into no, 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 no. Yeah. I mean, we're looking at it through uh, uh, what the big thing that it did 
was was not necessarily to do with beer or shirts or even music. What it what, what it was what it actually enabled you to do was if you were if you wanted to be in a band and you could more or less play a set of covers plus some of your own songs and the songs were all fairly short and you were fairly competent, you could get a lot of live work. Yep. It's an absolute abundance of live work because you had um it's not just the not just the pubs, you you mean you, you may have had twenty, thirty, forty pubs you could yep. you had polytechnics, technical colleges, art schools, drama schools, mm. university student unions, all putting on three bands a week. And you could just contact um entertainment secretaries at these places and say hey you know we're a band here's a cassette tape can we play and they would they would they would probably a percentage of them would book you in and pay you 30 40 50 pounds yeah Mm -hmm. yeah um so you could actually be in a band and do maybe 80 to 100 gigs a year just around london and the home counties i suppose I suppose you could say that as well as punk rock put it out of business, disco put it out of business. Completely. Because uh, yeah, people were going to clubs. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I mean, but there were even disco acts on the, that, that there were disco acts on the scene. Uh, on the, I mean, you could even see disco acts in parts of places like the Nashville. Uh, not many, but there, but there were. Um Although I, I I choose not not to write about them in the book because so, I mean you, you you have to draw a line somewhere you can't write about everyone who put a record out. Right. They're not going to appeal to the people who like meal tickets. Probably no, really. <laughs> that's the truth. <laughs> well, as you can tell, there's a lot of you know it, there's a lot of uh, reminders of bands that you've probably forgotten about. You know, we discussed quite a few of them today, including Grootner. I'm going to just say Grootner <laughs> once more. <laughs> just for the sheer joy of saying Grootner on a podcast. There's the book, uh, Before It Went Rotten by Simon Matthews, The Music Rock London's Pubs, 1972 to 1976. In your bookshop now, or available via uh, usual agents. Simon, thanks very much for your time. 